هذا أردنين أو أو ولا الدنيا أو سير أو خير أو صرف إكرام أو حلا جوري سوا نكسن ولا هدي جوري مرة بكون نقطة مشكلة يروك عش يدب يهمك أو سير عن أسوء أو يما هذا وحما قبل كرلين ورا كل رجل عظيم إنه عظيم هل كان سلام على قدرة سلام هيك خير لا سيو يا مطلبين يا زملو المركب مشكلة إسمع إسدجي الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين على أمور الدين والدنيا وصلى اللهم وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين من يرى المعروف بذلك سرية بيني بيني أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم هذا وأمسيت إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين عويسك أنا أقول لك وقد بيني إلى هذه من بقى عبدنا أذكى من بان كاك مطل بينا وحسوق أني فقردي قلت بيسي أمسيت إياك أم عويسك إياك وحن ما يلسه الإنسان بجاه يقلبنا إن شاء الله تبارك وتعالى ينوفرنا شيخنا I continue to think we have to make fundamental changes in civil rights, and those civil rights, by the way, include not just only African Americans, but the LGBT community. He wants to get away with the, and get rid of the ability of Medicare to, uh, the, to for the ability to, for the... I did not oppose busing in America. What I opposed is busing ordered by the Department of Education. That's what I oppose. Making sure that we're able to make every single solitary person eligible for what I've been able to do with the uh, with, with the COVID, excuse me, with um, dealing with everything we have to do with, uh, look, if you will determine the outcome of this election, vote, vote, vote. If you're able to vote early in your state, vote early. If you're able to vote in person, vote in person, vote whatever way is the best way for you because you will, he cannot stop you. And I'm going to continue to move until we get the total ban on the, 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 the total initiative relative to what we're going to do with more Border Patrol and more uh, asylum officers. President Trump? Uh, I really don't know what he said at the end of that sentence. I don't think he knows what he said either. Look. I'll tell you, I will give you a five years old analogy. Please. Palestine is like a fishbowl. A fish bowl. It's a lot of fish. It's condensed. There's like so much fish in so little air. And and Israel is like the person over that bowl and just like crashing the bowl, killing all, taking the fish anytime. Because you talk about hostages, but we never talk about Palestinian hostages. There are like five before October 7th, 5,000 Palestinian hostages in the prison of Israel. Now there's 12,000. Every single day, Israel can go in any house, take the house, burn the land, burn the olive oil, take the people, put them in. Isn't that hostage? That is a hostage situation that's been going on for years. But let's, so Israel can do anything with this fishbowl. At a certain point, Israel is just hovering over that fishbowl. And then at one moment, a fish crazy enough, suicidal enough, will jump from the bowl through the air, bite the pinky of Israel. And Israel like, oh my God, that bitch bit my pinky. My hand was not even in the bowl. And then she goes, and they go in and they destroy the bowl. And all you can see is Israel pinky. You know what I call this? Tunnel vision. What actually makes blockchain so powerful? Here's one amazing example using the Hedera hash graph. I'm performing a cross-border transfer from the UK to Bangladesh, which is settling in seconds and costs one hundredth of a cent. What's even more impressive is that I'm giving permission or signing the transaction with my personal account. However, the funds are actually being sent from a separate business account. This is using a powerful feature called Threshold Keys. You can find out more about them in the link in this caption.
hambal yo o buga o goba bin an rawa ina usodiro bismillahirrahmanirrahim yo kama bodai bisin ke irkan de dulka ambur burei badama shu ko mose wala kama bodai buwa irka alaga de bin hosta ada wixii dhaad u kala ga de ay email la soo dhaafi dhaada inaan ahayay kugu ma dheelay dublow inaan ay kuma darba ahay buudka inaa timid mi aan bii ku u diidi maxaa igu baaba eesi duuwaalid ka alaga ila darajana akta aada dami id dab mal oo dad waa kala dambeey aan durun durun ma soo bunni iyo durun wala aleed diriska dabkii ku kaco ada asku dambeeyay waalee salhum fi id dooro wixii halaab aayo ku sheega maahin afar bood afar bariis oo boora wa aadan bari asheegi ay buurtu inu ku aale malan khawaa ma jirte amba wa maskiinoobi mala gabanin ki is oo marooy may mayeelaay khalu quraan a askale qabni ee baale nafki khorle inaakti khurxumbo khal ma waayaan خلوب ولا خبور يلو اخري وا خبوب ان قات قات نكيلو يا خان خلي ملو ديبتو لما خرمت كي خا على اليس كا خاداي جيت لكو اله كا امر وجود كا عدادي عين لما علاليو نفتا لا لعب صوداي عزب اي انانيو كركاي كا عنعنيا من اثار وراب او خبال عربيه يا ال غري اله كا ما دي اي عدب اس اودي اسيس كا بيس كو خرو يو واس كو سياي عرضان كركيدن ابو اد كو عنه توغار ولالني مو مغلا اي كوحلو سو توغي تي بشي الى كو مريدو اي تانا ميل تالو سو تكي او كو سير فروا اثنا ساي كدي غلا ابتا سغال سنن كي او كو موب توبو اخر سؤال مله سيدي علم سوره ايسي لو اسبوك لي غلا سد بدن سو ت معريالي نين ولي بسد كي ساس عناي سات على ها ايا ولال كيس نكي مال حمد دمون امه تالو ميس اول حي لو غدي هل تعرف ما هو أقوى شيء اخترعه الإنسان؟ إنه ليس القنبلة الذرية أو الهيدروجينية بل إنه الهاتف الخلوي الهاتف الخلوي قوي جدا لا يستهتر بآثاره فهو قوي التأثير لدرجة أنه قتل الهاتف الأرضي وقتل التلفزيون وقتل الكمبيوتر وقتل الساعة وقتل الراديو وقتل المصباح وقتل المرآة وقتل الصحف والمجلات والكتب وقتل محفظة الجيب وقتل التقويم المكتبي أو المذكرة وقتل بطاقات الائتمان وأسوأ جزء هو أنه أيضا قتل العديد من الأزواج قتل العديد من العائلات وقتل الود والألفة الأسرية وقتل العفاف والحياء وقتل الرجولة والذكاء وقتل الطلاب أبعدهم عن طريق النجاح وجعلهم فريسة سهلة في مهب الريح وشيئا فشيئا هو كذلك يقتل أعيننا ويقتل العمود الفقري ويقتل العنق لدينا ويقتل عقلنا ويغير ثقافتنا وهو في طريقه للقضاء على الجيل القادم وإذا لم نراقب أنفسنا فسوف يقتل أرواحنا ويقسي قلوبنا ويذهب بديننا ويجعل الأجيال القادمة تندم حيث لا ينفع الندم
كتب العالم الجيولوجي العراقي فاروق القاسم وما زال الأغبياء يسألونك من أي قبيلة أنت فيقول لا تحدثني عن ثروة أي بلد وأهله مشحونون بالحقد والعنصرية والمناطقية والجهل والحروب نيجيريا من أكثر الدول غنى بالثروات والمعادن ومن أكبر دول العالم المصدرة للبترول ولكن انظر إلى حالها ووضعها والسبب أن الإنسان فيها مشبع بالأحقاد العرقية ومحمل بالصراعات فيما سنغافورة البلد الذي بكى رئيسه ذات يوم لأن بلده لا توجد فيه مياه للشرب واليوم يتقدم بلده على اليابان في مستوى دخل الفرد في عصرنا الحالي الشعوب المتخلفة فقط هي التي ما زالت تنظر لباطن الأرض ما الذي ستخرجه كي تعيش في الوقت الذي أصبح فيه الإنسان بحد ذاته هو الاستثمار الناجح والأكثر ربحا هل فكرت وأنت تشتري جوال جالكسي أو آيفون كم يحتاج هذا التليفون من الثروات الطبيعية ستجده لا يكلف دولارا واحدا غرامات بسيطة من الحديد وقطع الزجاج صغيرة وقليل من البلاستيك ولكنك تشتريه بمئات الدولارات تتجاوز قيمته عشرات البراميل من النفط والغاز والسبب أنه يحتوي على ثروة فكرية تقنية من إنتاج عقول بشرية هل تعلم أن إنسانا واحدا مثل بيل جيتس مؤسس شركة مايكروسوفت يربح في الثانية الواحدة 226 دولار هل تعلم أن أثرياء العالم لم يعودوا أصحاب ثروات طبيعية وإنما أصحاب تطبيقات بسيطة على جوالك هل تعلم أن أرباح شركة سامسونج في عام واحد 327 مليار دولار نحتاج لمئة عام لنجمع مثل هذا المبلغ من الناتج المحلي أيها الواهم بأن لديك ثروة ستجعلك في غنى دون الحاجة إلى عقلك دع عنك أوهامك فلا ثروة مع عقلية الثور هزمت اليابان في الحرب العالمية الثانية وفي أقل من خمسين عاما انتقمت من العالم بالعلم والتقنية وبقي الأغبياء يسألونك عن مذهبك أو من أي قبيلة أنت مع السلامة Israel likes to claim that it's the only democracy in the Middle East. Let's leave aside Israel's brutal occupation over millions of Palestinians in the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem and focus just on Israel's citizens. 18% of them are Palestinians. Do they really enjoy the same rights as Israeli Jews? Consider this. Israeli law allows any Jew from anywhere in the world to come to Israel and immediately become a citizen. But a Palestinian whose ancestors may have lived in the land for centuries has no such rights. Jewish cities and towns get much more per capita state funding for social services, education, and development than Palestinian communities do. Jews in Israel have privileged access to public lands, building permits, and government benefits, while Palestinians suffer from many forms of official discrimination. So it doesn't really make sense to think of Israel as a liberal democracy like the United States or Canada. Sure, many liberal democracies have histories of racism and discrimination. But in principle, a liberal democracy must treat all of its citizens, regardless of race or religion or origin, as legally equal and equally entitled to state resources. That's not Israel, which defines itself as an ethno-national state for Jews, making Palestinians second-class citizens at best. So even if Israel's domination of the occupied territories came to an end tomorrow, the question of Jewish supremacy within Israel would remain.
هذا ينصد حسن صد عيا صد نصنا أو دم بعجاء لوك أو كوسي يجرح هاي النبي تري يجرح هاي النو وصد عيا صد خلاص اعتراف خلاص خلاص كسر سارة يا بيت جو أي جان قاتي بركانو جو أي جان مالي تاسان مالي تاسان جو أي جان قاتي إلى هاي غير كأن كسر شيء جن عقلك أو سعودي مدة لبعض ميو سومالي وين باني إنه رنة إنه مدة صوران ومدة نرعيو أنا كاب صد هي صد سنين براك كتيرني براك برانكي بلا دقو أنا دقو بالبنك هو شيء كرام حلو بين الله بلا بنك هو شيء كرام أو سند بنك هو شيء كرام ثم سند بنك هو شيء كرام وحارة لا بعد تنك هو شيء كرام صد نك هو شيء كرام for Israel are we crazy are we out of our minds how are we letting this happen how are we letting it happen our money our representatives our military rather than stopping it is not only allowing it to happen but is participating willfully in this horrifically like I said sadistic form of genocide and like Zarifa was saying, the genocide didn't start after October 7. And the whole conversation about genocide is really quite interesting. Genocide is a crime. It's a well-defined crime. It was defined in 1949 to a large degree as a result of the genocide of the Jews in Europe by the Nazis. It's a well-defined crime. You can read it. It's not a question of opinion. It's not a question of, uh, do we feel about it? Do we feel it's genocidal? Do we not? But this is how the conversation is. Do you feel like it might be genocide? Is your opinion that it might be genocide? Read the law. It's very clear. It fits. It's genocide. They're murdering civilians for almost eight decades in a systemic way. Systematic erasure of a nation. Systematic erasure of a culture, a history in a country. That is genocide. There's no opinion here. The law is clear. The evidence is clear. And yet, the money is coming from us. The weapons are coming from us. The support is coming from us. And rather than condemning that, we're asked to condemn the Palestinians, the victims of this. Not the Palestinians are victims. I don't like to use that term. The Palestinians are heroes. They're not victims. But who is it that we're trying to, that, that we're supposed to condemn and why? And there's, there's a lot of similarities to what we're seeing now on campuses. You see the politicians come out. You see the university administrators and presidents come out. Why are they not standing with the students? Why are they not standing with the students? How can they justify to themselves not standing with the students? The students are demanding that their campuses divest from that war machine, that genocide machine. And who are the administrators and the politicians condemning? 
The students. Who are the police beating up? The students. Who's being arrested and punished and suspended? The students. Once again, we're out of our minds. And we're allowing this to happen? These administrators have a right to suspend these heroes? These encampments will be remembered as one of the greatest moments in the history of these campuses. Your names will be remembered. They'll be put on. It has a bigger impact on them because of location, because we have an ocean in between. You got to ask them, as far as Israel and, and Hamas, Israel's the one that wants to go. He said the only one that wants to keep going is Hamas. Actually, Israel is the one, and you should let him go and let him finish the job. He doesn't want to do it. He's become like a Palestinian, but they don't like him because he's a very bad Palestinian. He's a weak one. We saved Israel. We are the biggest pro pro producer of support for Israel of anyone in the world. And so that's, they're, they're two different things. Hamas cannot be allowed to be continued. We continue to send our experts and our intelligence people as to how they can get Hamas like we did bin Laden. You don't have to do it. And by the way, they've been greatly weakened, Hamas, greatly weakened, and they should be. They should be eliminated. But you've got to be careful for what using certain weapons among population centers. President Trump, just to follow up, would you support the creation of an independent Palestinian state in order to achieve peace in the region? I'd have to see. Hajj, my journey of a lifetime. I found Islam in a cafe in West Sydney. The actions and demeanor of the brothers I met there led me to discover the essence of Islam. Good character is the best form of dawah. They were caring, empathetic, and yet stoic, embodying a greater belief and mission in life. Now over 10 years later, I find myself in the Holy Land, where Islam began, Mecca. I've just fulfilled the final pillar of Islam, Hajj. For those of you who don't know about Hajj, let me tell you just how incredibly life-changing this journey is. Hajj is the last of five pillars of Islam, a sacred journey that every Muslim must undertake if health and wealth permit. They say you only get to Hajj if you've been invited, and my journey, like millions of others, is a reflection of this divine invitation. Our journey starts as we travel from Mecca to a place called Mina, approximately 10 kilometers away. Little did I know that this short bus ride would be a luxury compared to what awaits me. Alhamdulillah. In Mina, we stay in tents and the preparation begins. We rest and gather sustenance through water and food. And just as importantly, we prepare sincere prayers for ourselves, our loved ones and the entire Ummah. Scholars say this stage represents life in the womb, where all our important sustenance is provided and our journey of the life ahead begins. The next two days we embark on the most challenging stages of Hajj. Arafah, Mustalifa, stoning of the Shaitan, Tawaf of the Kaaba and Sa'i or walking between Marwa and Safa, along with the shaving of the heads and humbleness towards our Rabb, our Lord. It is in these hardships that we find our true selves. Scholars say that these stages are a representation of a believer's life in this world and the next. We all face struggles and hardships in this world, but our reliance on our Creator, not the creation, is vital. I stood on Arafah with my hands raised high in supplication, tears streaming down my cheeks, surrounded by my brothers and sisters pleading to the Most High, a true reflection of the day we'll stand before Him. At nightfall, we pray and then we head to Mustalifa, where we sleep outside on the ground. It is uncomfortable and hot with nowhere to move. As I took in my surroundings, I understood why the learned liken it to the resting in the grave. As dawn breaks, we rise for Salatu al-Fajr, which is the first prayer of the day, symbolizing the resurrection on the Day of Judgment. The dua we make after Fajr represents our anticipation of the accountability on that day. We then proceed to pout stones at the symbolic wall that represents the shaitan. This act represents our struggle against our whims and desires. Fatigued and sleep deprived, we continue our journey towards the Kaaba. This represents the ultimate meeting with Allah on the Day of Judgment. The strength and determination of the believers surrounding me become evident. Lastly, the three days spent in Mina represent the life of a believer in paradise. Here, all the prohibitions are lifted and we eat and drink in abundance while reading the Quran and making more dua. It is during these days that I see the wisdom in resting after so much hardship. I really connect with my brothers who having gone through so much hardship together will always have a place in my heart. I feel the nur, the growth and the love of Islam seek deeper within me. 
This journey has been the best trip of my life. As I embark on my journey back to my family and loved ones, I reflect on the true purpose of this pilgrimage, getting closer to my career. And just like the Prophet Ibrahim, who sacrificed this world and everything in it for the love of his Lord, pilgrims from around the world strive to do the same. Many believers lost their lives this year during the Hajj. And as Muslims, we can't say there's more of an honorable death. And inshallah, one day we get to join them in Jannah. Hajj teaches us the powerful lesson of putting our Creator over the creation, of prioritizing our relationship with Allah above anything else. It's through this act of devotion that we are raised and loved by Allah even more. You don't go through the hardship of Hajj unless you're a slave of Allah. And to be a slave of anyone else is humiliating. But to be a slave of Allah is an honor. And that's exactly what I am, his slave. Now if we rewind back to that distant memory 10 years ago in that small cafe, I now think to myself, SubhanAllah, imagine I had not taken that decision. Imagine I had been arrogant in the face of truth being presented to me. Imagine I had turned my back on the most important decision of my life. How I could have been deprived from Hajj, from Islam, from Allah. Alhamdulillah for Allah's guidance, for verily only Allah guides. Hajj, the greatest love story of all. Hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. This seat is not available. <laughs> sit there, sit there. Okay, right there is fine. You're adorable. So wait a minute. I asked if anybody's sitting here, and you said no. No, no. Uh, so I lost my father last year. <laughs> <laughs> I go oh. Oh. oh, that's so sweet. First of all, much blessing to your father. And uh, what's your name? Ritika. 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 Where are you from? India. Indian. Okay, wonderful to meet you. I believe also when they say when somebody passes away, they're always with you. Yeah? And uh, I'm Iranian. And I lost my father in 2015. And uh, I would never do that. <laughs> you know why? Because if I did that, my father's soul would be so unhappy. <laughs> I'm telling you. My father would be like, Max, I mean, why are you wasting money? <laughs> I am in heaven, having a great time. What did I teach you? You go up to be an idiot, you buy seats for me? Stupid, I am in heaven, having a good time. I don't even want to hang out with you. Finally, I died to be away from you guys. Now you're forcing me from heaven to come watch this bullshit? <laughs> hold on one second, hold on. Did you hear that? I just heard your father laugh. He goes, what a funny guy. I don't care. I like to come sit next to my daughter and watch your show, Max Emily. <laughs> to the heavens. <laughs> Juno! Wow. <laughs>
Not believe in two state solutions and only recognize one. I'm reminded that the great Bob Hawke once said in his op ed in 2017 that it is the least we can do now in these most challenging of times is to do what 137 other nations have already done, and that's grant diplomatic recognition to the state of Palestine. I ponder how the party icons like him, like Gough Whitlam, like Paul Keating, can justify its current position. Should we not be true to their legacy? I was not elected as a token representative of diversity. I was elected to serve the people of Western Australia and uphold the values instilled in me by my late father. Today, I have made a decision that would make him proud and make everyone proud who are on the side of humanity. What stage does it become too late in your view? I honestly don't know it. What I know is when we get to that point, the two-state solution will be resurrected. It's like the kings and queens of England, you know. The peace process is dead, long live the peace process. It keeps on coming back. Garda Kami, do you agree with Martin Indyk that it, it can't be too late because the two-state solution will simply be resurrected when the time is right? There is no possibility of two states for a very simple reason, that the land, the territory that would be needed for a Palestinian state hardly exists. It's full of Israeli settlements. But secondly, without the United States being able to use any kind of pressure on Israel, there will be no two-state solution. There will be nothing. And the truth is that the U.S. is unable to pressure Israel. It's not unwilling, it's unable. Today, Israel is a one state. It rules another people, it occupies them in one state. But the, the problem with that one state is it's an apartheid state. One side has rights, the other has none. So the issue really is not having two states, the issue is converting this apartheid situation into one of e e equity, and equal democratic rights and no apartheid. That's the thing before us. Right now, the most interesting thing happening uh, is Bitcoin. Uh, it's probably the most interesting intellectual development on the internet in the last five years. A lot of people will have heard about Bitcoin but not really understand it. So you think, okay, it's some online currency, what's the big deal? There's, you know, you can have a PayPal account, uh, that's kind of like an online currency or even your Visa card, well, actually all the, pro all the processing occurs online, isn't that really like an online currency? or you can buy gold that's kind of like an online currency. But Bitcoin is different because it is a currency that cryptographically 
fact multi-jurisdictional, uh, which means that it's very hard for any one power group in any particular jurisdiction to start turning it into a rent-seeking apparatus. The underlying technology of Bitcoin is cryptography on the one hand and the ability for cryptography to create situations that can uh, defend, them, defend itself or the people who use it against even the full might of a superpower. You know, a full might of a superpower doesn't help you smash a mass problem. A mass problem is a mass problem and it's something that is connected to the existence of intelligence in the universe or basic physics. It's not something you can get at simply through overwhelming coercive power or lots of people. And the other underlying basic technology is proof of publication at a particular time. And we've never really had that. In the digital world, we can delete history extremely easily. And history, even without an attempt to delete, it starts disappearing uh, as a result of startup companies going under or particular bits of history not becoming profitable anymore. And that notion of being able to disappear history uh, entered into Orwell's writing. And you can look at what is, I think, his most substantive intellectual comment, which is he who controls the present controls the past, he who controls the past controls the future. And it's this notion that the past as an archive, as a history of our civilization, as a history of development, is in fact present right now in something physically contained in the library, in computer servers, in human beings' heads, that history doesn't exist except remnants that exist in the present. And so if you can get at these remnants, you can make particular inconvenient parts of history uh, disappear and amplify others. Yes. Bitcoin in its underlying technology breaks Orwell's dictum. It breaks Orwell's dictum by providing proof of publishing at a certain time. And that is the intellectual underpinning of that whole system and can be used for lots and lots of other things. And so that's the big expansion we're about to see uh, in Bitcoin, all derives from this basic premise that you can prove that a particular statement, a particular consensus, a particular contract happened at a particular time globally. And it requires the subversion of every single jurisdiction where people are running Bitcoin to overturn that.